يعني البلد كابناء مثل ابناء يعني يعني فقدت واحد من اولادي بلد بلد الانسان بعد بلد ما بيسوي didn't have bad health to begin with, you're certainly going to get it here. It cost him about 1,200. It's a disaster. This is a huge, huge piece of this war that it's easy to forget about. Six years after war began in Syria, I've come to an unofficial refugee camp in neighbouring Lebanon. I see the kids first. I used to be just like them, running around with other Syrian kids many years ago. Little Khadija is four years old, the same age I was when my family left Syria, but in entirely different circumstances. <laughs> my family left Syria because my parents wanted a better life for their children. The kids in this camp are nowhere near as lucky, stuck in a land that doesn't want them, everything in short supply. With the mine, see mine. Khadija is one of more than half a million Syrian kids who fled to Lebanon officially. Unofficially, there could be twice as many. Lebanon hosts more refugees per capita than any other country, which is why the government stopped counting Syrian refugees a few years ago, unable to cope with the influx. I grew up in Syria, never expecting it to descend into the chaos that we're seeing today. And when you look around the camps, like just like these that are dotted all around Lebanon, it's really heartbreaking because there are children just like Khadija and all these kids around us now who are missing out on the basics that were available to them in a country like Syria. With no end to the war in sight, Syrians, young and old, are dying from treatable and preventable diseases. I wonder how you stay alive, let alone stay hopeful, as your old life slides further and further away. <laughs> Australian paediatrician Annie Sparrow doesn't claim to have all the answers didn't have bad health to begin with, you're certainly going to get it here. Every year she comes to Lebanon to help in any way she can. She's an expert in humanitarian health crises. This year she's already visited half a dozen times. I was working on the war maybe five years ago. I thought it would be for about a year. But I've come back because I can help in many ways to meet the need that they have. And I come back because the Syrians themselves are fantastic and I I love to work with them. We're heading to the Bakar Valley, home to an estimated one million Syrian refugees. In truth, no one knows the real number. Many of the refugees are undocumented, which means they can't legally work, send their kids to school, or travel within the valley to get health care. Given that you know, none of the refugee camps here are official, so they're not run the way that Zatri or the other camps are in Jordan, where they're services set up, 
So the burden of child health is huge, and the same for adults too. I mean, imagine they have all the problems of the first world. So chronic diseases we know, diabetes, heart disease, high blood pressure, cancer. And they have all these problems that we think of of developing countries. The malnutrition, the infectious disease, the typhoid, hepatitis, uh, dysentery. And on top of that, they have all the trauma of war. While the international aid community is bogged down in bureaucracy, Annie tells me about the thousands of Syrians losing hope because they can't get basic medicine for common diseases like diabetes. On our first house call, we're about to meet a diabetic patient. We're being introduced by a local aid worker, Dr. Bashar Al Khatib. Asra is 17. Azra, it's me, Anni. Um, Anna Tabibi. Thank you. We're surrounded by Middle Eastern hospitality, and Asra slowly opens up about her struggle with diabetes. So even though it was difficult, you could still access treatment, and you had no problems. <laughs> After three years as a refugee in Lebanon, Asra's once manageable diabetes could now see her lose something very precious. It's often very hard because the eyes are not equal and because the poor blood sugar control means that there's often blurriness. But, um, you know, her vision is going to change from often from day to day, particularly if she's not getting regular insulin. That Asra has had to ration her insulin since she came to Lebanon highlights a health system that can't cope. In their bare living room, no one can bring themselves to talk about the future. And what must be Asra's biggest fear, whether she'll lose her sight altogether. The strain shows, especially on her mother. With heavy hearts, we leave Asra and her family. The thing that really worried me about meeting Asra was obviously her diabetes is having a massive impact on her life, but you could tell that her mental health was also affected by it. Of course. It's, it's entirely normal to be depressed. It's catastrophic. She's losing her sight, mm. which is just about the most precious thing that we all have. And she's, she knows it's disappearing faster. And we watched her. It's blurry. It's, it's, get, it's deteriorating. And without that, she's, you know, she has a 17-year-old girl whose future is not just dim right now. It's dark and it's terrifying. Annie has come to the end of her visit to Lebanon. But I plan to meet Asra again tomorrow at a doctor's clinic where hopefully she'll get more news about the state of her eyesight. I find Dr. Bashar Al Khatib, who was with us at Asra's apartment. Today, he's running around trying to deal with all these patients. So, how many patients do you see here every day? Uh, I think here in every day we have uh, between 150 to 200 patients. Wow. This clinic is run by Syrians 
for Syrians. Bashir also had to flee war, but instead of immigrating further away, he chooses to stay close by in Lebanon to help his fellow Syrian refugees. People trust more the Syrian physicians because they are the same culture. They are their, their, their doctors inside Syria, and now when they, they come here, still the same doctors and still they know their patients. Bashir is about to see Asra. Inside the consultation room, we find her and her mum putting on brave faces. Asra's type 1 diabetes means her body doesn't produce insulin. A finger prick test will let doctors know how bad things are. I think it's 24 to here. This means it's, she, she, it's, a, it's a hyperglycemic, yeah. Asra's blood sugar levels are more than double what they should be. She's fasting, so it's, it's a high number for the fasting blood glucose. Oh, really? Yeah, 20, 240. What should it be? It should be below 125. Wow, okay. Yeah. It's a fuzzy plus, so it's, it's really high. Yeah. So that's a dramatic increase. What does that mean? So that means she's not controlling her, 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 her disease. So Dr. Ramis was telling us that uh, because of, of uh, diabetes, uh, she gets uh, an injury in his retina, uh, so in, in, his, uh, in her eyes. Uh, she had a bleeding and hemorrhage in both eyes, the left and the right eyes. The, the left eyes is, is, she, uh, is more hemorrhagic than the, the, the right one. She is seen by an ophthalmologist and she is uh, needed a surgery in both eyes. The problem that the, the surgery cost is high. Uh, each eye uh, needed like $4,500. Yeah, so it's a big amount of money for refugees. Nine thousand dollars to fix Asra's eyesight. An impossible amount of money for her family. Now I understand why no one was talking about the future yesterday. Uh, the, the situation will be uh, deterioration, and uh, she will get she will be blind at all. كيف عيونك هلا؟ وهلا بدك تروحي على البيت شو بدك تعملي؟ تروح على البيت. Asra may have escaped the bombs of Syria, but for so many chronically sick Syrian kids like her, surviving in Lebanon is becoming just as uncertain. Another diabetic child of war arrives at the clinic, and he's not well at all. In fact, the blood test reveals 14-year-old Aboudi is minutes away from slipping into a coma. They rush to put him on a glucose strip. How long does this process take? This will take like uh, 15 minutes or 10 minutes. Okay. Yeah. And then after about 15 minutes, his blood glucose levels will return to normal? Yeah, it should be like uh, more normal. So he's pretty lucky that something like this happened here? Yeah, he's so lucky because we can just manage it immediately. What would yeah. happen if he was at home? If he didn't uh, notice that and his parents didn't notice that, he may be good in coma. Wow. Yeah. This simple glucose strip is potentially saving Abudi's life. But it turns out his unusually pale skin is a sign of another problem. Uh, if he didn't control his blood glucose well, uh, the kidney failure may be worse and he may go through the hemodialysis. Yeah, and hemodialysis for refugees in Lebanon, it's, uh, it's a disaster. It will cost him about $1,200 or $300 per, per month. Yeah. As refugees, Abudi's family will never be able to afford dialysis for their son. He may can stay for a week or uh, two weeks without dialysis, but then he may uh, die. So we're talking about life or death right. situation? Okay, yeah, that's it. Abudi's dad arrives just after the drama has passed. Yeah, it's a life or death situation. I wonder if frightening moments like these are just part of life for the family. It turns out Abudi and his dad Mahmoud share the burden of diabetes together. Mahmoud also has type 1 diabetes. 
Both father and son have an easily treatable condition, but one of them is losing the battle. It's good to see our Buddha eating now with his family. They've got rice, potatoes and some yogurt. Much better now than he was when we saw him at the hospital earlier, which was pretty scary. <laughs> Their meal is high in carbohydrates, not ideal for a diabetic. In all likelihood, it's because they have no choice. Most of their meagre income goes towards rent on this apartment. Mahmoud takes me up to the rooftop for a quiet talk. The shadow of their past life looms over them constantly. Syria is just a few kilometres away. يعني <تصفيق> You can almost see the weight on his shoulders. While Lebanon struggles to treat chronic diabetics like Abudi and Asra, there's potentially a much bigger crisis looming, the threat of contagious disease. So while Lebanon may not want Syrian refugees to stay, it knows it can't ignore them. It can't be easy staying healthy in camps like these. We've just seen some open sewage right by a tent, someone's home. There are kids running around everywhere, playing with anything they find. It must be a real challenge to raise a family here. Oh, yeah. One of the little girls I meet in the camp leads me to her family's tent. Hi. Sham is one of five children being raised alone by her mother Nisreen, a widow. In the five years that you've been in Lebanon, has anyone in the family been sick? Uh, <laughs> Keeping kids physically healthy is hard enough. Gauging their mental health must be even more difficult. Nasreen says her older kids, who knew a life before the war, seem to be coping. It's her younger kids she worries about most, like Sham. <laughs> Oh, 
ان الحرب اثرت علي وعلى اولادي شيء ايجابي وشيء سلبي مو كل شيء سلبي ايجابي اني انا قوي صار شخصيتي اقوى بدي احافظ على اولادي سلبي انه انا طلعت من بلدي وتغربنا وضعنا يعني هيك متاهات هالدنيا بعدتنا عن اهلنا وبلدنا هن اولادي هن الدنيا كلها تبعي امالي انه يكون لهم مستقبل انه ما يضيعوا بالدوام اللي احنا هلا نحن فيها بتمنى ياخذوا حقوقهم يعني مثل مثل باقي كل الاولاد يدرسوا ويطلعوا شيء يعني ويسكنوا لو انه ببيت مثلا حاجه يعني حلم الخيمه صار علينا صعب كثير يعني صار يعني الصغيره صارت تقول لي ماما ليش نحن ما بنسكن ببيت؟ يعني هي انا كثير بزعل وبنقهر عليها Even though Syria still dominates the news headlines, Syria's refugees in Lebanon are very much a forgotten people. And Lebanon has become a land of lost Syrian dreams. Asra tells me what she would do if she could see properly. <laughs> أنا صبية بعمري لازم أكون شوف بعيوني بس ما عم أقدر شوف Coming to Lebanon and meeting Mahmoud, I think about the worries all Syrian fathers must have. My father got the life he was hoping for for his children when we left Syria years ago. I'm not sure Mahmoud gets to dream that big anymore. وشو بدي احكي يعني وهم كبير وعائله كبيره ومعاش خفيف ما في يعني هي هي ابني مريض هي اهم شيء اهم من المصاري انه ابني مريض اهم من المصاري، ثاني شيء انه مصاري بلادي 